group is out with a very startling report this Memorial Day on the impact of post-traumatic stress on our veterans. The Government Accountability Office says between 2011 and 2015, three-fifths of all troops discharged for misconduct, the military equivalent of being fired, had a diagnosis of PTS, a traumatic brain injury or other associated condition. But many of them were discharged without receiving required mental screenings to determine accountability, depriving them of benefits and maybe invaluable help as well. Dr. Devi is an associate professor at the NYU Langone Medical Center. Good morning to you. This seems critical to take a look at, particularly on Memorial Day, because you have people being uh, discharged, men and women, uh, from the military, and we may not know, their loved ones may not know, others in the community may not know that they need more help. Exactly. I mean, this isn't a small number of people. So 90,000 troops were discharged during that time period, and 12,000 of them were diagnosed with PTSD or traumatic brain injury. So those two conditions can cause symptoms where you have trouble concentrating, difficulty with attention and memory, uh, definitely things that could, let's say, make you late repeatedly, mm -hmm. which would be a grounds for a misconduct discharge, right? right. So, so for those folks, they may have a relatively minor reason for being discharged with a less than honorable discharge. Right. But at the same time, first of all, they have the stigma of the discharge, right? Second, they have the stigma potentially of being diagnosed with these conditions. And then third, they're not able to get the medical care that they need. We just heard Vice President Pence, in fact, talking about PTS and Project Hope, the charity that we mentioned that's doing bike rides all around the country, not just from Washington to Virginia Beach, talks about helping with rehabilitation, both physical and mental, for veterans as well as first responders. Uh, that's in, important to do. We've got about 30 seconds. What can we do? to help. Well, I think anyone who may have been discharged for misconduct should probably get a medical evaluation and get these things considered. I mean, we're talking about the actual diagnosis of PTSD or brain injury, but a lot of people don't get that diagnosis, right? They may have those symptoms. First, they might be concerned about the stigma of getting diagnosed, and second, you know, they may not want to have the diagnosis because that means they'd have to leave the rest of their team, right? And to your people point, then when they come back into a civilian job, if they're late for work, it might be for another reason. Exactly. So it's important that they get the help. We appreciate you coming in. Dr. Debbie. Thank you. Heather? Well, our brave women and men overseas putting it all on the line for us. Up next, we'll talk about an app that you can use to help military heroes overseas. Constipated? Trust number one doctor recommended Dolcolax. Use Dolcolax tablet. Look at that one inch incision, a lifetime of standing tall. Look at this, a terrifying scene at the Indy 500. Take a look, Scott Dixon sent airborne after being hit by a fellow driver. You can see it here, the number nine car flying into a retaining wall, flipping over and briefly going up in flames. Amazingly, Heather, Dixon walked off Unreal. under his own power. Yeah, you watch how close his head comes to the wall there. It's a dangerous sport. Stunning. Yeah, and the Coca-Cola 600 for NASCAR was yesterday, too. Always you on know the all that. Yeah, I sure do. <laughs> yeah. Race and country. Well, our men and women overseas are risking their lives to protect our freedom. And surprisingly, they don't always have everything they need. Or to some of you, that might not be surprising. But my next guest, founder of the nonprofit Troops you Need You, is working to help solve that problem. And joining me now is retired Lieutenant Colonel Eric Eglin. Thank you so much for your time today. You bet, Heather. Great to be here. And this is a great segment to do here on Memorial Day weekend. First of all, tell me about the basis for the app. Troops can request things and people can volunteer to give them what they need? That's right, yeah. So we've been doing this for 10 years, but now uh, we're in improving the technology and, and becoming mobile first. So people, uh, troops deployed in combat who have specific needs for their mission can go, log on to the app and, uh, and just with a few touches and a, and a mm -hmm. photo or two can request the equipment that they need for their mission. Likewise, everyday Americans here at home can help in a meaningful way. Uh, I saw thousands of care packages lying around in Iraq and Afghanistan. They can donate and that helps fund the equipment mm -hmm. that these troops need for their mission. And specifically, one example was a new uniform for uh, Special Forces. Tell us about that. 
That's right. So you've got people operating in, in parts of the Middle East. Uh, for example, this special forces team that requested these uniforms that blend in better uh, than the, the uniforms that they're issued, which kind of blend in for Iraq and Afghanistan. A good example is if you think about Colorado's desert mountains compared to Arizona's, you've got reddish dirt versus yellowish dirt. So they've got the, the uniforms that blend in great for yellow green type environments, but they stick out like a sore thumb in, in a reddish environment. So when they go out on sniper missions and surveillance against ISIS, they're, they feel like they're sitting ducks. So Makes we're going to raise the money to send them the uniforms they need. And that's the Memorial Day challenge. Uh, Colonel Eglin, thank you so right. much for your time today. You bet. Thank you, Heather. Hmm. What a wonderful way to help out. We're awaiting President Trump, meanwhile. He'll be attending a wreath-laying ceremony at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier at Arlington National Cemetery. The president will also be speaking there, just as you saw Vice President Pence at the Naval Observatory. We will, of course, bring you there live once the president starts speaking. You don't really connect with people very well. Leave it. You're getting a dog. Lose 15 pounds and 7 inches overall in your first month. Make the call now. Go online or call 877-380-SIZE right now and get Nutrisystem for Men with bars and shakes free. Well, we are awaiting President Trump's wreath-laying ceremony at Arlington National Cemetery as the nation honors our fallen heroes. Now, the president will also speak at Arlington, the final resting place for thousands of service members who paid the ultimate price for the freedom that we have today. Welcome to a brand new hour of America's Newsroom. I'm Heather Childers. And I'm Ed Henry. Shannon Bream and Bill Hemmer are off this Memorial Day while they throw a couple more burgers uh, there on the grill. We remember, of course, the sacrifice of the past. A battle is brewing on Capitol Hill about the future of our national security, with defense hawks bracing for a major battle over military spending. In his weekly address, President Trump laying out his priorities. Yet for decades, Washington has refused to make the tough choices. As a result, the American dream has slipped from the grasp of more and more of our people. This has to change. We need a government that spends on the right things, the safety, security, and well-being of our people, and stops the waste and abuse of taxpayer funds, whether in America or in global projects overseas. Doug McHale is live for us in Washington with the latest on this looming showdown. Good morning, Doug. Morning, Heather. Well, after his first overseas trip as president, one that is mostly regarded as a success, President Trump is now back in the so-called swamp with no shortage of threats, obstacles, crises, and quicksands in which to get stuck. Mr. Trump promises to fight that with characteristic bravado, which he demonstrated at that last stop at the Navy base in Sigonella, Italy. Have you notice how much stronger we're getting? Have you feeling it? Are you feeling it? All that new equipment is coming in. You saw what we did with our military budget way up. Took a little heat on that one, but it's okay with me. But the devil is in the details of the administration's budget, one that is not receiving the warmest of receptions on Capitol Hill, even among some Republicans. It does not rebuild the military. It doesn't give us the ships and the, and the numbers of personnel we need, the capabilities we need. It heals some of the readiness wounds, i.e. 60% uh, of our F-18 aircraft are not flying for lack of parts, those kinds of, of things. But as far as really a, uh, the buildup that the president promised during the campaign, no, my friends, no, it's not there. Indeed, the budget includes no new ships beyond what President Obama had planned, nor does it add any new troops nor airplane increases. Critics also add the president's expectations are unrealistic, seeking huge tax cuts while also promising to increase health care spending. Just last night, Mr. Trump tweeted, and I'm quoting, I suggest that we add more dollars to health care and make it the best anywhere. Obamacare is dead. The Republicans will do much better. The president is also being hammered by Democrats who accuse him of massive cuts to entitlement spending. The president's budget director, Nick Mulvaney, has repeatedly countered that, uh, that out-of-control entitlement spending will saddle future generations with an unsustainable debt burden. He also notes that Democrats disingenuously refer to uh, budget reductions in spending increases as cuts when they are not. Heather, back to you. Mm. All right. All in the wording. Doug McKelway, live for us. Thank you, Doug. You bet.
Meanwhile, the German Chancellor, Angela Merkel, raising eyebrows by speaking out after last week's NATO summit and her meeting with President Trump. She's now urging European countries to stick together, saying they can no longer rely on America. The times in which we can fully count on others are somewhat over, as I've experienced in the past few days. And that is why I can only say, we Europeans must really take our destiny into our own hands. We have to know that we have to fight for our future and our fate ourselves as Europeans. Joining me now, Kelly Jane Terrence is the Deputy Managing Editor for the Weekly Standard. Uh, thanks for joining us. I wonder what kind of selective memory Angela Merkel may have. She seems to be pining for the days of the Obama administration when, as I recall, they were surveilling her cell phone. Yeah, times do change, don't they, Ed? Uh, yeah, you know, it's, I think, you know, she obviously was taking a little bit of a dig at President Trump and Prime Minister Theresa May uh, by saying that we can't rely on others, the United States and the Un United Kingdom. But I actually think the president should welcome her comments if she really is serious and the rest of the leaders of Europe are serious about taking their destiny into their own hands. It really is time for them to step up and take a bit more responsibility for themselves and right. not relying on the United States, uh, as they certainly have a lot in the past. Right, Kelly. It's interesting to me that the immediate reaction of the mainstream media has been that Angela Merkel is attacking President Trump when she says, in part, Europe should decide its own destiny. Well, hello, wake up. Weren't, shouldn't they have been doing that for a long time on their own? Why is America controlling their destiny? Exactly. And, you know, the reason people, I think, think that it was a bit of a dig is she, you know, used the little aside there. I've discovered this over the last few days. But really, the, the thrust of her comments is positive. We should all be welcoming the fact that Europe is saying, hey, let's step up and take responsibility for ourselves. Now, it's interesting that they're only saying this now that Obama, President Obama, is out of office and President Trump is in. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned former President Obama because there's another aspect of this I want to bring in, which is that just a few days ago, before these remarks from Angela Merkel, former President Obama was meeting with her and said this. If there are disruptions in these countries, if there's conflict, if there's bad governance, if there's war, if there's poverty, in this new world that we live in, we can't isolate ourselves. We can't hide behind a wall. You know, critics have been saying that President Obama there, while saying he's going to mostly stay on the sidelines when he's mentioning a wall there, he's attacking President Trump, and he, he was doing that just a few days ago with Angela Merkel at his side. Yeah, I think, to be honest, I think it's kind of outrageous for Chancellor Merkel to be inviting and welcoming former President Obama so publicly on the exact same day she was meeting with President Trump uh, later that day in Brussels. It's kind of outrageous to, to be doing that. And you know, pre President Obama, you know, it's funny, you sort of read the media stories about it and they're all saying, well, uh, you know, he didn't mention Trump by name, he's trying to uh, stay positive. But no, that's, you know, obviously saying we can't hide behind a wall is a direct reference to, to something your, that President Trump has said many times. To your point, I was covering the early days of President Obama coming into office, and if on one of his foreign trips, former President Bush popped up 12 hours before, after they had been deeply divided on national security issues, uh, I suspect there would have been a lot of criticism in the mainstream media. There would have been. You're exactly right, Ed. Can you imagine, you know, they say that, you know, it's completely inappropriate for a former president to be taking the spotlight instead of letting his successor do his job. And I think President Obama has to recognize, hey, sorry, you're out of the spotlight now. You're no longer president. You need to step aside and let the president deal with uh, other uh, world leaders and let him have his chance to do what he said he's going to do. He may or may not do it. But, you, you know, President Obama has trouble giving up the spotlight. Quick let's, last let's question. Face it. uh, it's been widely suggested around the world, even President Trump's critics suggested, this was a pretty good trip for him, his first foreign foray. Uh, is it just a coincidence that all of a sudden this criticism is being piled on from Angela Merkel, who has been a strong ally of President Obama? It just seems odd that after a strong trip, all of a sudden there's this pile on. 
You know, I think that no, no matter what happened on the trip, there was going to be a pile on. You know, President Trump is a very polarizing figure, and I think, you know, people have trouble saying, you know, he, there's a lot of things he's done, in my view, wrongly, uh, not good ideas, but then he's done some things that have been successes, and we have to recognize them when they happen. And I, I think that there is, uh, in the media and in abroad, people just don't want to recognize that, hey, maybe this guy can sometimes do a, do a good job, give a great speech, talk, talk about the things that matter, Imagine like terrorism. That. You and might note it when he does something right. <laughs> Kelly Jane Torrance of the Weekly Standard, we appreciate you joining us. And Thanks, four, months, four months to go before elections yeah. in Germany as well, exactly. so keep that in mind. Well, France's new president, meantime, Emmanuel Macron, promising tough talk with Russia. Macron meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin for the first time since taking office. Well, it comes just weeks after his campaign accused Russian media of trying to interfere in their election. And Macron says that dialogue between the two nations is vital, but relations are tense as Moscow and Paris back different sides in the Syrian civil war. Meanwhile, another missile test out of North Korea. The rogue nation launching its ninth test this year alone. This one coming dangerously close to Japan. We'll have more on that. And we follow up on yesterday's tragic stabbing in Portland where the two victims are being held as heroes. And Defense Secretary James Mattis, Mad Dog Mattis, says the U.S. military is preparing to ramp up the campaign against ISIS. Our next guest gives his take on the military's new approach. Our strategy right now is to accelerate the campaign against ISIS. It is a threat to all civilized nations. My only job at Fox is to keep company with heroes. I've been driving a boat for six months, pretty solid now. Parasailing! Open to the armed forces, the DOD, veterans, and their families. Navy Federal Credit Union. The search for answers continues after a massacre kills eight people in rural Mississippi. Police say a family dispute led to the shooting spree that took place at three separate homes. A sheriff's deputy responding to the incident among the victims killed. You can see him there in dramatic video just minutes after officers capture the alleged killer who told a reporter didn't intend to be taken alive. Watch. Somebody called the office. People that didn't even live at the house. But that's what they do. They intervene. Mm -hmm. They're causing his life. I'm sorry. So what's next for you? Deal. 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 My intentions was to have y'all kill me. I ran out of bullets. Oh boy, tragic scene. I ran out of bullets, he says. Investigators are now pursuing charges, but say it's too soon to speculate on a motive. We are going to move in an accelerated and reinforced manner, throw them on their back foot. We have already shifted from attrition tactics where we shove them from one position to another in Iraq and Syria to annihilation tactics where we surround them. Our intention is that the foreign fighters do not survive the fight. Well, we just heard Defense Secretary James Mattis, his new goal to kill ISIS militants rather than just forcing them to retreat. This as U.S.-backed Iraqi forces push into Mosul to liberate the remaining ISIS-controlled districts of the city. I'm joined now by Walid Ferris. He's a Fox News national security and foreign affairs analyst. Thank you very much for joining us. It's a pleasure. Thank you. So, as you heard him speaking there, he said, moving from attrition to annihilation. And what do you take that to mean? Heather, the shift uh, that is implemented now by Secretary of Defense Mattis basically is a change of direction in how we fight ISIS in the sense that their military machine should not survive. So we're not pushing them from Mosul to go to another city, from Iraq to go to Syria or other way. So what he's trying to, 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 to do is basically to, to break that machine so there will be no survivor, surviving institutions or cells that could regenerate in the future. So how do you do that? What are the annihilation tactics that would be used? 
basically increase of air power, increase of all the other, uh, you know, uh, arms and, and possible tactics to make sure that they are encircled and they're not going to flee to any other uh, area. But there are two things to consider. This is a change of tactics. What we need to look at is a change of strategy as well, in the sense that we need to make sure that those who are going to be in charge of the areas that ISIS is going to be evacuating are not going to regenerate another ISIS. So that's a very important point and who's going to help us with it. And the second point, quickly, mm -hmm. is basically making sure that the ideology is not going to survive, not just the weapons. All right, so let's go back to both of those things you just mentioned. I mean, what will happen, like, what is the challenge that happens after the annihilation that you just mentioned? The first challenge that we've seen before, Heather, is what we defeated Al-Qaeda in Iraq a few years ago, and then we withdrew. What happened is that the Shia militias backed by Iran came in. It triggered an uprising by Sunnis that was taken into advantage by ISIS. So we're going to make sure mm -hmm. that those going to be in charge in those areas are going to be local Arab Muslim Sunni who are not going to be creating the environment for the next jihadi group. Yeah, but, but as you know, Waleed, all of this is, is a lot easier said than done because we've been attempting and trying to do this. So what makes me think or what makes us think that it will be different this time around? It's to have the tools. Tool number one is to have enough troops on the ground mm -hmm. to ensure that once those areas are evacuated, we are in control, and then we can bring in allies on the ground. And two, to have coalitions. And I think the trip by the president to the region and the rise of that coalition, we heard of 34,000 troops ready to help us. Mm -hmm. This is the challenge. This is the test. And, and speaking of that, just quickly, let's listen to what the president had to say on that uh, in, in Sicily. Listen. You are the men and women who make up the most powerful military in the world, and under my administration, as you know, you've seen it, right? Under my administration, stronger and stronger every single day. So exactly what you were just saying, and they have the backing of this administration. I want to move to a second point here, though. We've heard about uh, bin Laden's son taking over leadership of al-Qaeda. What do you think that means for us? Look, if this was uh, immediately after the death of bin Laden, I would say he could become a high symbol in the jihadi movement. He's going to become a high symbol, at least within al-Qaeda. But meanwhile, over the past three to four years, you have the rise of ISIS. ISIS will be defeated by their membership, their supporters, and other jihadists around the world. The movement has gone so big and much larger than before. He would play a role, but not the role that some analysts and some experts think he would. So, so ISIS defeated, then al-Qaeda rises back up to number one? Do you think that'll happen? That's a great question. I am not sure. There are many people with different opinions. My opinion, and there will be a sort of a merge for a new organization, a new jihadi organization, that will have the, the remnants of ISIS and some parts of al-Qaeda mm -hmm. as well. We've seen some of it around the world at this point in time. I was going to say, as, as uh, history would teach us, that does tend to happen. Waleed Ferris, thank you very much for your insight. Thank you. Meanwhile. On this Memorial Day, President Trump about to pay tribute to the fallen as we await his wreath-laying ceremony at Arlington this coming after the Commander-in-Chief spoke to U.S. troops in Italy over the weekend. Every single day you protect the safety and security of the American people and provide a symbol of hope, freedom, and justice. Speaking of national security, North Korea does it again test firing yet another ballistic missile. A live report on the latest provocation from the Pyongyang regime still ahead. That's next. Everything your family touches. Therabet products are available at pharmacies, supermarkets, and super centers. Welcome back. Oregon police have identified the two men who were fatally stabbed Friday on a train. 53-year-old Rick Best pictured there on the left and 23-year-old Talison Mechie. According to police, both men lost their lives standing up against a man who was yelling ethnic and religious slurs at two female passengers. And witnesses say that Mechie and Best tried calming the man down when they were viciously attacked. Another victim was injured but is expected to be okay. Police arrested 35-year-old Jeremy Joseph Christian. He's charged with several charges, including aggravated murder, and he's being held without bail. Mm. Meanwhile, Fox News alert, North Korea launching yet another missile test yesterday. The missile was identified as a SCUD, a relatively short-range surface-to-surface missile.
but it still traveled nearly 300 miles from North Korea's east coast, landing in Japanese waters. Lucas Tomlinson is live from the Pentagon. Lucas, it seems like these missile tests just keep on coming. Well, that's right, Ed. Good morning. This is the third consecutive weekend that North Korea has conducted a ballistic missile test going back to Mother's Day. Now, yesterday, Defense Secretary Jim Mattis says it's not just missile tests from the rogue communist regime that he's concerned about. The North Korean regime has hundreds of artillery cannons and rocket launchers within range of one of the most densely populated cities on Earth, which is the capital of South Korea. But the bottom line is it would be a catastrophic war if this turns into uh, combat. The Pentagon says the Scud missile flew for just six minutes, not as concerning as another test just weeks ago from Pyongyang of a new type of ballistic missile called a KN-17, which traveled for 30 minutes, flying a staggering 1,000 miles above the International Space Station, re-entering the Earth's atmosphere and landing just 60 miles from Russia, longer than any North Korean missile to date. Now, Ed, Secretary Mattis yesterday did not give out any red lines pertaining to North Korea, choosing instead to keep his cards close. At this time, uh, what we know I'd prefer to keep uh, silent about because we may actually know some things the North Koreans don't even know. What keeps you awake at night? Nothing. I keep other people awake at night. In the past few weeks, the Pentagon has doubled its firepower in the region. The USS Ronald Reagan Strike Group deploying from Japan joined the Carl Vinson Strike Group already in the region, giving American commanders two aircraft carriers and other warships capable of launching cruise missiles. Now, Ed, the Pentagon is also planning a missile test of its own. Tomorrow, the U.S. De Missile Defense Agency will launch an intercontinental ballistic missile into space, like the one you see here from the Marshall Islands in the Pacific, and intercept it with a missile from a base in California. Officials say it's like hitting a bullet with a bullet. And now, Ed, there's some historical significance with the Marshall Islands, of course. It was the site of the first American counterattack following Pearl Harbor. Ed? Well, and the secretary says he keeps others up late at night, a not-so-subtle message, perhaps, in the North Korean regime. We appreciate your time this morning, Lucas. Yeah, that was a great quote, for sure. It Mattis. will live on for Mad a while. Mad Dog Mattis, yes. And as we continue to monitor the situation in North Korea, uh, we're also waiting President Trump's appearance at Arlington National Cemetery as America honors those who made the ultimate sacrifice in defense of our freedom. Keep it right here for our special Memorial Day coverage. Plus, a day of fun takes a horrifying turn after a young boy flies off the side of a giant oh. water slide that had just opened up for the summer. Oh boy, every parent's worst nightmare. Details straight ahead. Obviously, that's not what you want to have happen on your first day, uh, but we want to, I mean, we want everyone who comes to this park to have a safe and fun experience, and that's our primary goal. President Trump is about to leave the White House any moment now for Arlington National Cemetery as he prepares to perform one of the most solemn duties as Commander-in-Chief, laying a wreath at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, part of a ceremony to remember the men and women who died fighting for our country. The President returning to U.S. soil on Saturday night after a grueling trip overseas, his first as President. On Fox News Sunday, former House Speaker Newt Gingrich teeing off, yes, on the mainstream media who say Mr. Trump is facing chaos here at home. I hope they will come home, focus on jobs, health, uh, infrastructure, tax cuts, and basically shove to one side all of this garbage. That was actually Fox and Friends, but you get the idea. The speaker speaking out, Charlie Kirk, is the founder and executive director of Turning Point USA. And Democratic strategist, strategist Jose Arista Munio. I mispronounced the previous one because I wanted to get that right, and I think I did. He's the former DNC deputy press secretary. Thanks for both uh, being here. Uh, I want to start with you first, uh, Jose. Uh, what is uh, the deal with all of these attacks, one after the other, after a pretty successful foreign trip for the president? He comes home and immediately is back in the swamp. Look, what, whatever happened to, to making America great again? I mean, we got scandal after scandal, day after day. Now, 
Trump's uh, son-in-law is involved potentially in, in sort of what happened with Russia during the 2016 election. I want him, look, I want him to do well because I want the American people Wait, to thrive. Jose, I want, I'm going to give you a lot of time here, but I've got to stop you there because when you say, as a former DNC official, you want to see this president succeed, you have to understand my skepticism because the Democrats in Washington and around the country, uh, in, in all sincerity here, they have not wanted this president to succeed. Look, we want him to succeed, but this is, the, this is the thing, though. He tried to push a bill. Look, he tried to push through a bill, the, the, you know, the so famous Trump care. It's not working. We, he hasn't even passed the Senate. He celebrated at the White House. For what? If it even, hasn't even become a law. So what he's got to do is let's, let's improve Obamacare. Let's, let's sort of get away from this nonsense about building a wall. Let's get away from the nonsense about the Muslim ban that, by the way, court after court is saying that it is unconstitutional. Jose, uh, you call what? all of those things, and I'm going to bring Charlie in in a minute, but you call all of those uh, plans nonsense. The wall, the ban, these are things the president ran on and he won the election. The, the majority of the American people don't want the wall. The majority of the American How people... How did he win? <laughs> well, look, I mean, the polls, the, polls, the, the polls are telling us that the majority of Americans don't want it. They want us to work together. They're tired. This is why the Republican Congress, I think their approval rating is under 20%. I well, mean, he's got to get things done. But I, you know I what? promise I'm finally going to bring in Charlie, but you're saying you want the president su to succeed. You're saying you want people to work together. Charlie, have Democrats shown any willingness to work with this president so far? Almost none, and I, I will, there's a lot there to refute, but let's focus on one key point that, that I think you pointed out rather well. Trump failed and see America succeed. That's what this all comes down to. They would rather play political games. It's absolutely true, and Chuck Schumer is doing everything he possibly can to pass an agenda of infrastructure that Democrats, for eight years under Obama, they said, we love infrastructure, we love infrastructure. Trump posed an infrastructure bill. No, 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 we don't want to touch that. Okay. They say they want tax cuts yeah, under yeah, Obama. Right. Now they don't want tax cuts, one thing after the other. So they can't have it both ways. And Jose, look, they say all these different things under, the, under Obama, and all of a sudden they oppose them. Jose, so look, there's a lot there to refute, but the American people are behind this agenda. And it's not just conservatives like Charlie. Jose, look what uh, former v Vice President Joe Biden said this weekend about Democrats. Uh, this is within uh, the party itself. He basically said that you are not for the working people. Because of the negative campaign that President Donald Trump ran, so he is blaming President Trump, to be clear, how much did we hear about that guy making 50000 bucks on an assembly line and the woman, his wife, making $28,000 as a hostess? They have $78,000. Two kids are living in a metropolitan area and they can hardly make it. When was the last time you heard us, he means as Democrats, talk about those people? Jose, this is not a Republican attacking your party. Joe Biden says all you're talking about, basically, I'm paraphrasing this part, but you're talking Russia, Russia, Russia. Joe Biden says you are not talking about the working people. Look, we can always do better. We can always do better. And this is why the Democrats just launched a tour where we're going to go ac across the country and talk to the American people so we can find the solutions to their problems. I mean... Yeah, go ahead. Jose, uh, I would just want to give Charlie the last point because Jose and I went a few times. Charlie, what's your final point? Well, the final point is this, is that Donald Trump has put forth an agenda that's going to put people back to work and put this country first. He's just going to need a Congress to work with him. That means both parties. But if the Democratic leadership is more interested in playing petty politics and actually serving their constituents, they're going to see more and more election results like they did in November, and that is middle America that is rejecting the party of the coastal elites. Charlie. And everyone watching this show knows that the Republicans are going to be the ones working for them. Charlie Trump. Kirk and Jose Arista Muno, who now has to work with President Trump. We made some news this morning. Thank you, Jose. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. I want to do that. What about this? A scary moment caught on camera over the weekend. A 10-year-old boy goes flying right there, just flying right off a water slide, skidding across the concrete. This happened at a water park in California. Wow. Mm. Claudia Cowan is live for us in L.A. Claudia, what can you tell us, first of all, about the condition of the boy? Is he doing okay? Well, actually, Heather, good morning. He's doing just fine, which is pretty amazing. Given this boy landed on his back and slid several yards before stumbling to his feet and walking away, happened in the town of Dublin up in Northern California. Now, take another look. He had pretty much gone down the whole ride, a steep three-story drop called the Emerald Plunge. He had his arms crossed over his chest as instructed when he suddenly flew out at the bottom. That's the flat washout area, and it's supposed to slow riders down, but not this time. The boy landed with a thud and skidded across that wet concrete. Incredibly, he just suffered some bruises and scratches on his shoulder and was said to be in good spirits, even smiling.
This video shot by a local newspaper reporter who was covering the water park's opening day. It's now a key piece of the investigation into what went wrong so this kind of thing doesn't happen again on this ride or any others. Heather. Unreal. He got up and walked away after that. Uh, so where does the investigation stand? Well, a team of inspectors will be out there again today from the city and state as well as the water slide company that built the Emerald Plunge. The ride had been tested for several weeks and was certified by the state of California. Officials are obviously looking closely at how that ride was designed, but also at possibly changing rules for riders. We have a height restriction. We're going to evaluate whether or not we need a weight restriction for this slide, and we'll work with the manufacturer to determine that. We'll check the pressure of the flow of the water to make sure that that needs to stay constant. Uh, those could be contributing factors. We're not, we're not entirely sure. We need to take a better look at it. Until we do, we're not going to open the ride. And along with that slide, park officials closed two others as well. That's three out of the six rides there. Not the kind of splash you want to make when you're opening a $43 million water park on a holiday weekend. Wow. I'll just Heather. stick to the slip and slide in the backyard. <laughs> Thank you, Claudia. I see what you did there. Yeah. She said splash. Yeah. Big splash. I see that. That was good. <laughs> a New York City police officer may want to think about trading in his uniform for a basketball jersey. Watch this. We're going to make the truck. Hey, Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Oh, Jeremiah. I have a little You meant to give me a dollar. Oh, no. You meant to give, give me a dollar. No bet, no bet. Yeah. Yeah, bang, bang. Oh. <laughs> oh, nothing but net. That's Officer Garthlett James making an epic shot from the sidewalk next to a Bronx basketball court. Spectators, as you heard, erupting in cheers as he drained it over that iron fence. You see it again there. And if anyone in the Knicks organization is watching, you may have found your next shooting guard. The yeah. Knicks actually, Heather, need a lot of help right now. Or just now. have him out there as a spe uh, special guest, him and the kids. Wouldn't that be great? And he's still doing his duty. Yeah. The New York uh, police officer putting his life on the line for all of us. So that's what we should focus on right. even more than the basketball. And we should show more um, opportunities like that with officers Good moments interacting. with kids, yeah. interacting with the community. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of them out there. And a federal judge, though, we're going to still talk about this, just tossed a lawsuit against Hillary Clinton mm. uh, that was filed by the parents of two of the Benghazi victims, just tossed it out. Our legal panel will talk about it up next. This is one of the, the things that on Memorial Day, it means much, much more when you have lost a family member. My name is Justin Lansford, and I'm a veteran of the Iraq and Afghanistan. Mike will include free shipping. Don't delay. Get two MyPillow premiums for one low price, plus free shipping. Order now. For the best night's sleep in the whole wide world, visit MyPillow.com. Hillary Clinton off the hook. A federal judge dropping the lawsuit against her filed by the parents of two of the men who died in the Benghazi attack. Now, the judge says that Hillary Clinton did not def defame their children, but the parents disagree. Defamation is an issue of fact, which is to, to be decided by the jury. The judge decides issues of law. This should have been submitted to the jury. So let's bring in our legal panel. I'm joined today by attorney Jesse Weber and Kent Zimmerman, a National Journal contributor and former general counsel. Thank you both for joining us today. You. you bet. So agree or disagree with the, the decision? Kent, I'll start with you. You know, this is a tough case, Heather, because you've got these men serving bravely in Benghazi. They lose their lives. Their family, you want justice for their family. They bring this case. But the unfortunate thing is, based on the law, the court finds that actually there isn't justice for the family in this case. The law says mm -hmm. that Hillary Clinton may have suggested the family was mistaken, but to have defamed them, she would have had to call them a liar. She would have had to put them in a bad light by making a false statement, and the, course, the court found that, that she didn't do that. This will go up on appeal, though. It's not over yet. And, Jesse, there were a couple things involved, not only the, the defamation part of it, but also Clinton's use of a private email server, uh, the family saying that that uh, caused their son's death as well because it allowed terrorists access to sensitive information. Absolutely. Look. You know, you would think that after all the trouble that she has had with this email server and the Benghazi scandal, she'd be liable for something. 
Unfortunately, under the law, she's acting within the scope of her employment, namely as the Secretary of State. And the court ruled under the law, she's actually immune from tort claims being brought against her. It's actually the United States government mm -hmm. who becomes the defendant. And that's really a big problem for the plaintiffs here to bring their suit in under those claims. Um, Kent, you mentioned the possibility of appeal. Uh, you just heard Charles Woods there at the beginning of the segment, of course, the father of Tyrone Woods. Um, when he was speaking with Fox and Friends over the weekend, he went on to say that he, too, wasn't surprised by this ruling because the judge was appointed by the Clintons. So will that have any impact on what happens moving forward? You know, I'd be surprised if it does. But I, I, I see the argument that way, and I see how it's easy to say, listen, politics intervene here. The law should get justice for these people. And I think everybody wants justice for a family who's lost somebody uh, uh, under these circumstances. I think it'll go up on appeal. Mm -hmm. There's a slight possibility, I would say, that it'll get sent down and maybe retried in front of a jury, but I, I'd call that a slight possibility. Yeah, and let's pause here and take a listen to Patricia Smith, um, the parent or the mother of Sean Smith. And this was what she had to say when she was speaking at the Republican National Convention. Listen. I blame Hillary Clinton. When I saw Hillary Clinton at Sean's, co Sean's coffin ceremony just days later, she looked me squarely in the eye and told me a video was responsible. Since then, I have repeatedly asked Hillary Clinton to explain to me the real reason why my son is dead. I'm still waiting. And it really rips at your heartstrings when you listen to that and you know the pain that these families are going through. Um, but Jesse, the court had to rule in terms of what was legally right and just, correct? Uh, right. And you know, the law, I wish sometimes it would catch up with common sense. But here's the problem, and Kent was ma making a point about it earlier. With defamation, what really hurt their case was that they couldn't show harm, namely, that the statements that Hillary Clinton made, how did that hurt you financially? How were you not able to obtain a job after this because of what you said? How was your reputation damaged in the community? How was your life affected in a way that would not have been if you didn't make those statements? So I think moving forward, if they appeal this case, if they refile it, really focus upon how you were hurt and you may see some success. Yeah, and let's not forget, uh, four lives were lost in Benghazi. Uh, Sean Smith, Tyrone Woods, uh, Glenn Doherty, and of course the ambassador of Libya at the time, Chris Stevens. And on this Memorial Day, we remember all of them. Uh, yes, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. And moments from now, President Trump will arrive at Arlington National Cemetery. See people gathered now. He will lay a wreath at the Tomb of the Unknown and address our veterans. We will take you there live as he addresses the entire nation as well. But first, we'll talk to members of the PGA about their project to help veterans cope with post-traumatic stress. How taking to the links is actually making a difference. You have a vision. It's behind everything you do. Even when you least expect it, it comes through. You know what you want, and we can help make it real.